to supply chain. The worldwide pandemic has continued longer than anyone could uh, have uh, predicted, continuing to present male industry challenges for all of us, like dramatically changing postal markets, oil prices increase, uh, war conflicts, uh, but uh, also many, many legal challenges focus especially on the uh, EAD exchange, electronic advanced data exchange. Uh, and uh, that's the reason why UPU and IATA continue to work through uh, these challenges and focus on effort to lead ongoing initiatives and provide capacity building activities like this uh, webinar and technical support to help our members to be ready for these uh, challenges or regu uh, regulations which have to come into effect during this time or uh, those which uh, are still upcoming. Thanks to uh, our joint work with the IATA, uh, uh, we already organized uh, previously two successful webinars. The first one in November 2021 and the second one in April 2022. Uh, I hope that uh, also today's uh, meeting will be fruitful. We received more than 350 registrations uh, for today's webinar and I count on your active participation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, I'd like, I spoke about the active participation, so uh, you can, of course, use a, a chat window uh, to ask questions, or uh, you can uh, raise your uh, virtual hand if you want to uh, have uh, any comment or, or uh, uh, question. Uh, I'd like to let you know that uh, the session is being recorded, and we will use, of course, uh, uh, recording uh, mm, for uh, for you later because uh, all slides uh, presented today and uh, the recording will be made available to you after the session both on the UPU and also on the IATA website uh, and uh, you will receive I will remind you at the end of the meeting uh, you will receive also a link uh, uh, to fill your comments and uh, evaluation of the workshop uh, through the monkey survey. Uh, so to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, I will go, uh, uh, I will present on the next slide just uh, very shortly uh, agenda for today. As you can see, we have uh, more or less four uh, topics for today. Uh, first, we will give a floor to the International Postal Corporation to present uh, their uh, tool to improve visibility of the uh, mail uh, the, uh, Hector will present mail registration device. Then we will have a block of uh, uh, three presentations uh, focused on paper-free transport. Uh, then uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Vini will present dangerous good in the uh, in the post. Uh, the, uh, and uh, we will uh, um, present also uh, the uh, current EAD status uh, by uh, Meta Boysen from PostNord. So uh, I think that's uh, very shortly from my, my side. I'd like to give a floor now also to Andre, because as I said, it's a joint IATA UPU webinar, and Andre Majare is the lead on the IATA side to prepare this webinar. Andre, floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much for, for giving me the floor. Uh, so again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm Andre Magiris. I'm working at IATA uh, as the head of uh, uh, cargo and mail operations and uh, e-commerce as well. Uh, e-commerce goes into cargo or mail, so uh, obviously it's 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 part of uh, uh, the business. Um, I would like to join uh, um, Jan in uh, welcoming you to this webinar. Uh, it is, in my opinion, extremely important that we provide you with uh, uh, important information about ongoing activities in uh, the airmail uh, uh, business. Um, very important because indeed uh, the, the pandemic has not been extremely kind to us and uh, 
Though uh, the cargo uh, business has been extremely resilient uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, there are some uh, hard times ahead of us, uh, talking about uh, uh, energy prices, uh, fuel rise, uh, the prices of fuel, uh, talking about geopolit geopolitical uh, situations and so on. It's uh, unfortunately affecting all of us, and I suppose that in your countries you have already uh, noticed those effects. So it is extremely important that we uh, continue collaborating uh, uh, post and airlines, extremely important that we continue collaborating, and IATA UPU as well to coordinate this at a, a higher level. Um, we have been working IATA and UPU together for about uh, 70 years, and we have a, a common MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, for more than 50 years, uh, because uh, uh, airmail is uh, the first commodity that has actually ever been flown uh, by an airplane. Um, so it's, it's extremely important that we continue that cooperation and that we provide you with uh, all the information that you need to perform your, your duties correctly. So we have a a fantastic lineup of speakers today. Uh, the topics are also extremely relevant in these times, uh, talking about uh, digitalization uh, and talking about safety. Uh, I think it's extremely important that we continue uh, hitting the nail on that. Uh, security with EAD is also uh, at stake. So, yeah. Uh, Take this as an awareness, this, this webinar, and should you have any additional question, you have, again, all the speakers and you will have your, their contact details at the end of the webinar, and you can always get back to UPU and IATA uh, in order to get more details. So I, I wish you uh, a, a good webinar, and uh, hopefully you will find an interest in all these topics. And if you think that uh, something is missing, well, then, of course, as Jan mentioned, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar, and we will be able to then and give the focus to these activities that you would like uh, to see happen. So thank you very much again for uh, being here. And I'm looking forward to this webinar, I hope, just like you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, for your uh, uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I appreciate. And uh, I'd like to go to the next slide and uh, start with the first presentation. I'd like to give a floor to, uh, to Hector. Uh, um, uh, Hector Martin Arias uh, from, from the IPC. As I said, uh, uh, he will present, uh, he will present a very uh, interesting and very useful uh, tool uh, to monitor the, uh, monitor the um, mail operation critical processes in the operation and increase the visibility of the uh, of the network so uh, i would uh, like to give a floor uh, hector to you everything is okay can you start okay. with your presentation you can thank um, you hear me thank you yes we can hear you we can see you okay Perfect. Uh, am i sharing my my presentation i, I wasn't it wasn't clear for me if uh, because I, there's a video involved and so i thought it was only the video but any case, I can. I have my presentation here, so I can I can share my screen, and we can go straight to the to the presentation uh, itself. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, my uh, name is uh, Hector Martinarias. I work for the International Post Corporation as a senior manager network integration. Um, as such, I have been involved in uh, projects relating with uh, airmail management and uh, airmail projects in general for about 15 years. And one of these projects is uh, the mail registration device um, uh, tool. Uh, first of all, before I start with the presentation, I would like to uh, uh, start by thanking um, our friends from IATA and uh, UPU for giving us the opportunity to present this tool and to uh, participate in this webinar, which we uh, fully support as IPC, as, a, as an important uh, platform to share knowledge and uh, raise awareness about the available uh, tools and the, and the critical issues that the industry is facing. So uh, thank you for, for, uh, for that. Uh, and um, I hope uh, that the ones that are not familiar with the, this particular uh, tool that IPC has been develop developing, uh, for many years, uh, we'll find some interesting uh, content here. So I will proceed um, uh, then with a, a bit of background on, on what uh, 
EMRD uh, is about, because uh, for some of you, this is a tool that you know and you use, for some others, it's a completely new concept. So uh, why would we need uh, such tool? Um, first of all, this uh, comes out of, a, uh, of a, uh, the observation of some operational issues that had to be addressed. Uh, first of all, uh, again, we're talking, we're talking about a number of years ago, but some of these issues remain uh, critical today. Uh, the insufficient or absent uh, electronic database visibility of handover processes, the famous gray areas of the, um, of the handover processes. Uh, we as posts uh, and airlines are um, processing and sending mail all over the world. Uh, we do not have a camera in each airport to know how things are uh, going. We sometimes receive uh, contradictory information, and that's what the second bullet point is about. Um, uh, <clears throat> not all the data that are provided and generated are necessarily uh, trusted by all stakeholders. Um, uh, we enter into the uh, uh, discussions, meetings, uh, sharing of information uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, the he said, she said situations when it uh, is about measuring or having an exact idea of when and how the handover processes uh, um, took place. That's the key thing here. Uh, handover is, comes with a physical uh, transmission of, of a mail uh, product, but it also uh, is a transfer of custody and a transfer of accountability. And uh, it often determines the fulfillment of a service. So it's a very important process, uh, a very important process that it not, it's not, it's not always properly uh, monitored. So uh, that is, uh, uh, that is an, uh, uh, an observation of, of an operational issue. There's also situations where non-standard operational setups in some airports make it difficult to understand actually where and when the handover takes place, with, even by, 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 by uh, observing the operations, it is not easy to determine the exact moment and time of the of a, of a transfer of custody of mail, both at origin and destination airports. We're talking about two, uh, uh, two processes here. So again, the gray zone in mail handover operations uh, was identified a while ago as a, uh, uh, one of the biggest areas of waste in international postal transportation and IPC already in 2007, that's starting to, to date, Launch the mail registration device concept to try and support and to try and, and help bridge the gap in visibility in such processes. All right. So this is a bit the context. Um, a few uh, points I always like to present when presenting the MRD because sometimes there are misunderstandings about the, this tool. Um, what the MRD is about, uh, the MRD as a concept, as a project, the mail registration device. Again, providing visibility over two critical processes taking care of that gray zone. So handover at origin, handover at destination in the airports. Um, it is primarily oriented to monitor transport related operational uh, events. So we are talking about um, uh, trying to better uh, understand the uh, handover, hence better understand and better manage the uh, transport stretch and uh, potentially, of course, improving the uh, way this uh, transport stretch is uh, managed and making it more performing. Um, the MRD is a, is a, is a tool that uh, records events at ULD or unit uh, and at receptacle level. So it is important because sometimes there are uh, conf confusion around this that the item level, postal item being a package or, or a, a letter or a, uh, a parcel, is not uh, in scope of it. When we are looking at a specific tracking event for an item, uh, we shouldn't at least uh, primarily use the MRD for that. Although uh, there are ways be it based on nesting information where we can also get information at item level, but it's not the main focus. So there may be gaps there as well. Um, a key element about the MRD, a key message is that uh, its success relies on the involvement of multiple parties. So. Uh, the sending posts, the airlines, the receiving post, and the ground handling agents need to all be on board of this process because the data produced uh, are a combination of what these parties are um, uh, providing to the process. 
And uh, because of the use of the MRD, the amount of events, of critical events, ResDIT21 delivery and ResDIT74 possession origin events, two key events, uh, the amount of uh, this uh, type of ResDIT events uh, can be increased. What the MRD is not about, um, IPC being a non-profit organization, the MRD is not a commercial product, although it sounds like it because I talk enthusiastically about it. I am not selling this uh, to you. Uh, we are uh, not going to make any money as an organization out of this. We simply cover the cost of installation. And this comes from our members' mandate to us, the postal operators that are members of IPC, uh, to provide solutions that improve uh, operations in a network approach. Okay. Uh, we don't claim that uh, this is the only system that can uh, uh, provide the value that we uh, think it provides. There are other systems. There are system vendors providing scanning equipment uh, and other solutions to provide the visibility. Uh, there are alternatives to it, but uh, since these are not deployed uh, in every airport and by every airline, the MRD provides a universal way to provide, um, to, to, to record uh, handover information. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're not monitoring item events. We can derive item events, but it's not the primary objective of it. And we are not using the MRD to determine liability on operational issues. We often get the question, what if a a bag gets lost on the tarmac. What is, if there's damage uh, of a mail bag, uh, how can we use the MRD to better uh, uh, address that? Well, the answer is you cannot. That's not what the MRD is about. There are other ways uh, defined uh, by the, uh, among others, by the UPU operational guidelines to address uh, these type of situations. The MRD is meant to, again, record very specific uh, information. This is a, a bit of an old picture, but uh, for the ones uh, that are not familiar with it, uh, the MRD is pretty much uh, physically what you see on screen. It's, uh, it's a box, a metal box, typically. Sometimes the box is removed uh, for ease of use. Uh, it has a scanner, a printer, and a terminal, a touch screen, a computer that is used to record a bit of information upon the delivery of mail. Okay, it is installed at specific locations, and it's very important, the, the concept of specific locations identified as handover points at origin or at destination of mail consignments in airports, basically. This is an air mail monitoring tool uh, as it should be. Regarding the operations, um, we use a video uh, that many of you probably have seen already, but uh, that uh, helps us uh, convey everything that uh, is critical uh, to know about an MRD operation on the proof of delivery scenario. So we are talking about one of the two main uses of an MRD, the one to record the handover at destination. And we use for that the most standard process that one can find in airports, which is the so-called push scenario where the ground handler is bringing mail to the postal facility and delivering it into a yard or into a warehouse where the post will take over that mail and will further process it uh, in, their, uh, in their system, in their network. So uh, the classic, uh, it's not the only one and we have solutions adapted to others as, as the last bullet point says, IPC develops alternatives to these uh, uh, let's say standard use um, uh, to adapt them to operational scenarios in uh, different airports. So uh, this is just a one use that uh, shows the, um, um, uh, the main principles of use. And I had opened the video already here. So I'm going to go from, from uh, uh, here. I hope you can see it on screen. Um, it's a YouTube video and I use it, it has no sound, I use it as a support for the presentation of the MRD concept. So the MRD is based on a two-step uh, uh, process approach. Uh, first is a handler operation, second there's a postal operation. This video was shot in uh, Copenhagen, Amsterdam and Paris, is a combination of images from these three sites. Uh, here we're uh, seeing the Post Nord uh, Denmark uh, airmail unit in, uh, in Copenhagen in, in the airport. And uh, I pause here the video every time because the first element of an MRD is where is it physically located? It's critical that the MRD is located at a meaningful point from a handover point of view. 
in this case, the entrance uh, of the building of a, of a postal building. And you see a shed with a little plant here on the, behind the truck. That's where the MRD machines are installed. And it is um, extremely um, uh, important that it is determined where it should be installed based on where the handler releases custody of mail to the destination post. In this case, uh, in Denmark, it is on this yard that you saw uh, at the beginning of the video. So first element, the MRD is physically located at the handover point. Second element of importance, and you'll see now, there's a first process by the handler. The handler only processes nest level information. So we have, a, I pause it here again. We have here a handler in this example. You see on the back, there are two carts with mail uh, receptacles on them. So this handler uh, will only need to scan twice, two times, because there are two cards. Um, the expectation is not that the ground handlers need to scan every bag, because we will see later how we consolidate the data in a way that uh, the receptacle level information can be uh, derived from uh, this uh, nest level operation. So, we see our, our friend here, he's going to go to the MRD, uh, he's going to grab the scanner, and he's going to go and scan again. Um, uh, two, uh, two scans here, one per cart. Um, he's using receptacle IDs as a, as a scanning uh, source. Here we have other examples. You see, you look for one bag ID and they take it, whichever, it doesn't matter. Um, it's not a, a matter of what is scanned, as long as it is one uh, unit ID, uh, at a time. It could be the ULD ID you saw in the Paris. It could be in Paris or in CDG that it, it was a, a ULD ID uh, um, uh, on, a, on a delivery bill. The important here is that there's one scan per nest. Okay. So then comes the operation on the MRD. I identify myself as a handler. Uh, they have the two units here and a uh, identify the flight information uh, for these units that I am delivering. So in this case, it's KL 592 in, in Amsterdam and both units that were scanned come from that flight. So what I'm saying here is these two units, these two carts um, uh, contain flight, uh, um, contain receptacles that were flown on KL 592, okay? It could be different flights. It could be even a mix of flights. The system then prints two labels, one per cart. In this case, it could be three. There had been three scans. And a third one, which is a proof of delivery label, a ticket, that in this case, the handler is using as equivalent of a signature by the post to confirm the delivery of this unit. So the units, the UL, the unit scan are listed on the paper you just saw, and uh, they have a proof of delivery with the time of delivery. Then the labels that are printed at the previous step are attached to the corresponding units. These are the labels that you just saw coming out of the printer to the diff, this is in Amsterdam, for instance. And, uh, and, that's, and that's it. From a handler point of view, the process is done. So the first advantage of the MRD, the handler is scanning very little, just a couple of times, a couple of operations on the touch screen saying this comes from this flight, is a matter of uh, 30 seconds, uh, in many cases, in most cases, less than a minute. And, uh, and that's the end of it for the handler. And at that point, the handler is stopping the clock for these units. He's saying these two units were delivered at this time. Now, you will ask yourself, that's very nice, but what about the content of the cart? Because for the moment, the process is not telling us which bags were delivered at that time. It's only telling us there were two units from these flights that were delivered at this time. And that's where the second part of the process starts, which is the postal part. Uh, the post has a role to play in consolidating the information. As you see, uh, our colleague here in, in, in Copenhagen is grabbing the same label that the handler puts there at the unit level and is uh, starting with his own scanner, in this case, IPS, the, uh, the, the system that is the most widespread supported by the UPU and the PTC. So most posts have that process and the PTC is supporting the configuration of the system to be able to uh, fulfill this process. We'll uh, start with that scanner, the start barcode here on the label. Here in Amsterdam, same system, uh, start barcode. With that same scanner, 
um, there will be a scan of every uh, either loose bag, a loose uh, parcel, or uh, every receptacle out of that unit. So IPS is recording all these scans. These are not scans that are uh, mandatory because there is an MRD. These are scans that the post are doing anyway to generate postal EDI. So we are not asking the post to do an extra, uh, extra work, just the, the, the little additional uh, uh, scan on the MRD label uh, before they start. And, uh, and then once the unit is empty, you will see now in a second, they scan all the bags. Once the unit is uh, empty, they will scan a stop barcode from the MRD label. There's our friend in, in Amsterdam, here in Copenhagen. And by doing that, they are uh, determining, they are telling us which bags were associated with that label. So what we have now is from the MRD, we know which flight was delivered at what time. That's what the handler recorded. From the start, and stop process and the labels that were scanned in between the two, we know which bags belong to that unit. And by consolidating, uh, this information is forwarded to us from the postal system. And by consolidating the two sources of information, we can say that each individual bag that was denested, that was uh, linked to the unit ID was delivered at the same time that was recorded with the MRD. So by this consolidating process, we can tell all the stakeholders involved that uh, these bags were delivered at 10.43 uh, p.m. in this case, uh, a.m. And here, this is a, another key aspect of the MRD. Uh, and I'm going back, sorry, with the video because it's an important message here, is that all these data are shared one way or another with all the stakeholders. Everybody involved in the process has access to these data. Um, either through reports that we make available to the stakeholders through our CAPE platform, which is free of access for both uh, uh, posts, uh, carriers, and, and, and handlers. So they see all this information on reports, uh, but also we have uh, file sharing with carriers and handlers or with posts upon request. All this data sharing brings transparency and is shared with everybody. Uh, and comes from a third party source. So there's no bias, there's no uh, uh, interest in manipulating the data. All the stakeholders that are currently using the MRD acknowledge that the information coming out of it, if not always complete because some steps of the process can go wrong, it is always uh, accurate in terms of um, uh, the uh, information recorded, all right? Um, so this is as far as the video is concerned. I will take questions at the end of a, of a session uh, on this and other elements I'm about to present, but the principles of the MRD are there. Nest level scan by the ground handler. So for the handlers and the carriers, this is a very important, sorry, the, closing the video. Uh, it's very important for the handlers and the, and the carriers that they don't have a very heavy task up on delivery. So it's a few scans only in a machine that is uh, provided by a third party located at the handover point. And that's an assessment that IPC makes. And a consolidation of data and sharing with all the stakeholders. So everybody has access to the same information. There's no uh, longer, the uh, again, the discussion about different sources of information reporting different uh, uh, um, uh, data from uh, different systems, okay? The implementation status today, uh, this is uh, uh, almost uh, outdated already. Uh, we have a few uh, ongoing assessments. Uh, um, the MRD is constantly growing, growing. Again, we started in 2007. We have a number of active locations, some others that are being assessed or have been assessed. Um, part of our job is to actually expand the use of the MRD because the users of the data from the MRD are asking us to do so. They think that the data they see from the MRDs are uh, useful and reliable, adding value, and they are encouraging IPC and its members to support the expansion of the MRD. So um, um, as you can see, we started initially with uh, IPC's membership as a, a focus, because in the beginning, it, it's what it was, but now we are expanding further and we keep exploring new installations. We are constantly in talks with new candidates for installation. 
A quick word on the POC MRD, the proof of co uh, custody MRD. So it's the same type of principle um, uh, for the origin MRD. So again, the post physically nests into a container. The handler uses the MRD to record the nest handover. And IPC consolidates data in slightly, uh, uh, in a similar way as for the POD MRD, but with using different sources. We use carded information, which is the postal uh, EDI message uh, for pre-advice for the carriers in the room, the equivalent of the FWB or XFWB. And we consolidate the information. And again, the principle is nest level process, but receptacle level information for handover. And we have a few uh, sites equipped, a bit less. It started later, uh, the progress of POC MRD. But again, we keep expanding and we have now new good prospects for future installations in the, in the near future. We have uh, already some ongoing uh, that have been confirmed and, uh, and uh, we are expanding the POC MRD installations as well. An example of reports, I'm not going to uh, hold on this one too long. Uh, we have all kinds of reports um, based on the principle. We have KPIs uh, that will tell us uh, how good the process is in a certain airport. Uh, we show receptacles and delivery times at some point uh, on the reports, but uh, I would like to focus on, uh, well, there are some for carriers as well. I will uh, not go in detail into these because I don't want to go over time now, uh, but um, key message here, everybody has it, uh, have their own uh, set of reports available, carriers, handlers, uh, posts, uh, and uh, they can have uh, valuable information out of them uh, because of the use of the MRD. That's what the incentive to use the MRD by all the stakeholders is the value they get in return. And that is the amount of data they can get for uh, not uh, for limited effort, say, in, in operations. This is an example of an extract of a receptacle and what the MRD is telling us. Uh, this is a carrier delivering mail in Amsterdam. Um, if there was no MRD, the carrier would have reported a delivery of the mail to the sending post on the 15th of September at 11.23, Resi 21. Okay, so that's what you see here. And the next available information would have been the postal scan for Rescon at 11.26, five days later. So for a sending post, post, the two pieces of information would have been, the carrier is telling me they delivered on the 15th of September. The post is telling me they received it on the 20th of September. I have a five day gap and I don't know what happened. Okay, that's the gray zone. They have two parties introducing two different types of claims. But luckily for us, we have a POD MRD and the POD MRD actually tells me that the delivery into the handover point was recorded by the carrier on the 20th, by the carrier's representative, the handler. So it wasn't the post making this registration. It was the handler on the 20th at uh, 9.13. So the real story here is that something happened between the moment uh, where the Resi 21 was generated uh, by the carrier and the actual delivery of the mail. And uh, MRD is giving me a bit more uh, of a true story here. This is a, an example of a report where you see a flight uh, that was this one re record for that flight and then 11 receptacles had a proof of delivery uh, timestamp based on that registration. So it's one scan gives me 11 proof of deliveries as a carrier, okay? This is the, this is the handler uh, report, by the way. Uh, that is available to handlers. The carrier report is pretty much identical. So what to do with a, an MRD installation? Uh, again, I'm not gonna give many details here. There is a whole process that IPC follows once the different parties express interest. And it's important that all the stakeholders are on board from the beginning. So we don't usually take a request from an airline or from a post individually. We need that all the stakeholders in a certain airport are informed and are on board because all of them have a role to play in the operations. Uh, so we have a preparation phase where we are preparing, assessing the whole uh, operation. Will an MRD be suitable with the operation? What should be the setup and so on? Then we uh, prepare the machines, we ship them, they are activated. 
and then we support and uh, monitor operations. Available documentation and contact details. Um, we have a website with plenty of uh, documents available. Uh, the MRD handbook, uh, it's uh, password protected, but anyone can ask uh, for credentials and pretty much we agree to most of uh, the requests. Uh, the MRD handbook is a big, uh, not a big, yeah, it's a big, but it can be used in small pieces, a big document that uh, has all the practical information about the MRD. It is ideal to get started because it contains uh, what you saw in this presentation, uh, links to the user guides that are also available on the website, but also operational maps of the different sites where MRDs are installed. So uh, you don't need to be uh, aware of what the operational setup is in uh, Budapest, for instance, to be able to tell a uh, carrier or a handler, you could use the MRD. It is located at the entrance uh, at this particular point in the, in, the, in the process. So that's also available. All the available reports, the different stations that are equipped, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the MRD uh, webpage is, of course, where we're trying to centralize all the information, but you can also directly contact IPC. And I know there are some contact information that is also provided after this meeting. Um, I put my name there, but my colleague Claudia, who's also present today, is about to take over the management of this project. So either of us will be still in the loop for a while together. Uh, so for more information, for um, uh, detailed presentation, um, our colleague Martial is uh, our analyst, supports, uh, supports the different users of the MRD and the reports, provides training and uh, helps with action plans to improve performance. And when there are operational or technical issues, which unfortunately uh, we cannot avoid, we have a help desk in IPC that can be contacted to report issues with the data sharing or with the uh, actual machines. Uh, also, it is uh, fair to say that the UPU, uh, Jan, I appreciate that uh, uh, support uh, personally with you and your colleagues have been supporting uh, the efforts of communication around this project and have been also uh, let's see, letting us know about interest expressed by uh, uh, some stakeholders uh, with them. So pretty much the message is um, one way or another, uh, we get uh, the information and we can be contacted and we will be in touch in case uh, an MRD installation is uh, foreseeable uh, somewhere. So um, um, normally I have like, about two minutes of uh, questions uh, open. So I would gladly take any questions from the participants and, uh, and uh, yeah, I open the floor for that. Thank you very much, Hector. And uh, uh, I like now to give a floor to anybody to raise hand or a comment in the chat. I. Was a question in the chat, but I don't know if it was. Um, I do not see any question in the chat. Do you see some question? No. You know, I no. saw it, but it was not related. Uh, uh, yeah. No. No. Thank you very much, Hector. Uh, of Thank course, you. uh, your contact uh, will be uh, will be uh, as you mentioned on the last slide. Uh, we will uh, share all presentations on the UPU and IATA website. So uh, anybody who is interested. Uh, can contact you or can contact, of course, uh, UPU, and uh, we will share uh, that request with you and you will answer. Good. Uh, you, so, Here's... something more to add, Hector? No, thank you really for your time and your and your attention uh, here and happy to to address after the meeting any any other questions or requests for for further information. Thank you very much on behalf Thank of you very much. I think it's really very important to have as many as possible available tools to improve the uh, visibility of the mail, of the handover processes, especially this tool is for handover processes to, to as, as you understood. So uh, we support any, any uh, technical solutions to improve uh, visibility and, 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 and uh, quality of the postal supply chain. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to give a floor. Uh, we would like to move to another topic. Uh, we would like to uh, um, focus now on uh, paper-free transport. And I hope that we are able to give a floor also to uh, uh, 
our next speaker, uh, QN uh, from Vietnam Post. So uh, uh, I'd like ask Irina to share her slides, and uh, I'd like I'd like ask QA uh, uh, raise your hand, and we will give you a floor, please. So I see QA is asking for a floor. Can we manage her, uh, to give her a floor? Uh, can I get a support from the PTC or? Uh... <clears throat> can you not speak QA? I cannot hear you. Hi, John. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well now. And uh, Irina will take care about your slides. So uh, floor is yours, QA. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. And uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's also nice to join the webinar of uh, EPUs today. Uh, actually, Vietnam Post, we just only share some of our experience on how we can do on our project of CN38 paper free project. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, I would like to share something about the digitalization. So all the DL uh, want to know what is it and how we can approach to this. And once the UPU, uh, particularly the committee one, just uh, kick off the project of paper free of CN38 and also the EAD model to all the deal. Vietnam Post with our understanding, we see that it is like a very nice opportunity to pick off uh, the background and to help Vietnam Post to approach with the digitalization to our supply chain. So today we would like to share something like a case study of Vietnam, how we can do and how we can uh, expand more the project to the other destination after the kickoff project uh, by Vietnam Post and the Postnot. So on the screen, you see that it is a, like a my store, how Vietnam Post start and now how we do. Uh, of course, you see by January of 2021, it's not very nice time to start up our project uh, uh, CN33 paper free. Uh, Actually, because it, it was seen as a pandemic COVID-19, but because it was a very nice opportunity and Vietnam Post is very confident with our cut it and rest it, exchanging with all the air carrier who have contracts with Vietnam. So we do agree with John and Mette that Vietnam Post is a volunteer to join this project. So at first, uh, we kick up by January of 2021. We do a lot of uh, processing together. And then we have uh, decided to trial time uh, until the May of 2021. And after the trial, so we find out that it is very good and everything was is smooth. So we just uh, kick off as officially. Next slide, please. So, and also it is uh, how we implement in the operation processing. Uh, Vietnam Post and Post not have decided that we just adjust together both outbound and inbound from Vietnam to Post not. And we also have addressed all the IMPC code of office of train who will enjoy to our project of paper free. Next slide, please. And after that, we have also the review and we have also the checklist for all the DO who want to get more experience if you want to join also the paper free of CN38 project. Uh, the first, you are have to be confident that both origin and destination DO uh, having the cut it and rest it message with the airline carrier that uh, it is objects of our project as well. The second one, 
all the scope of service have addressed also. For example, in our case study, Vietnam Post and Post North, we did agree together that we will cover all the letter post, parcel, and EMS. And the next one, we have to think over how to do. It means that we have to set up also the procedure to push up our project. So here you can see the mark from the beginning at the end. At first, we need also the meeting of agreed meetings together by three party. And based on the three party agreement, we have a size together to get all the scope, all the uh, pro all the objective and also the processing how to do by three three sides and then you can take the trial time after trial and time you can the review and then we can kick off the of official implementation so here like the hand uh, checklist for all the deal that want to to do how to process here and the key point of the agreement and checklist you need to remember it is uh, we need to address the operation and handing over processing is very important. Perhaps operations by the post is no problem, but the operation and also the handing over between the airline and also the GHA is also the issue that we need to look over. And the next one, the key point that we have to keep together, it is EDI message. So what is EDI message and how we can understand to support this our project here? Next slide, please. Here, this is the answer. Uh, the name of our project, it is a paper free of CN38. How we can replace on CN38 manual paper? So it means that you have to understand all the EDI that can support this. So we just list here all the EDI can support. The first pre comb and rest comb, cut it and rest it. And the message of EDI pre comb, rest comb, and cut it, rest it. It is the all the EDI with full information, the receptacle with pre advice, a receptacle or confirmation, a receptacle arrive and also the full CN38 data to confirm as a proof of a handing over of dispatching at origin airport or confirmation to origin post on the proof of dispatching arrival to the destination airport. So here, it means that all the EDI can support we to replace CN38 manual paper. Bayern, we understand that uh, with all the electronic EDI here, it is will be as a proof to support all the deal who join the project here for the payment later on. Next one, please. And after very successful uh, cooperation with the post uh, of course, with the support from Jan, with the support from the Madame Mete, uh, so Vietnam Post would like to make more progressive status in this. So here this is the my so how we do, how we trying to expand our project to the other destination with the support from different air carrier here. Uh, so by August of 2022, uh, with the cooperation uh, of the Qatar Airway and uh, with the support from Mr. Jan, we just open more the three party agreement signed by Vietnam Post and Dutch Port. And by September 2021, uh, 2022, we just have a imp officially implementation. But uh, with the Dutch Post, Vietnam Post, we just open only for the outbound, but inbound not yet, uh, because uh, Dutch Post have some issues in this. Uh, next week, we also have uh, the ASEAN meeting post of our community. So the objective of Vietnam post in this uh, conference, Vietnam would like to extend more the our paperless project to all the other 10 members of the ASEAN community and with some the uh, a carrier edge tie away. Um, Thai Airways, Vietnam Airlines, and also Singapore Airlines. 
uh, and our ambition also expand to the Europe, to uh, uh, Great Britain, France, and some of the other destinations that we have a much more the volume. Next slide, please. So this is our understanding or also the review after we have a very uh, successful uh, projects with the postnode and also uh, Dutch port. The first, it is benefit. Uh, it is only understanding of deal who can draw here. We can speed up and level up a performance of our service. The second one with the process of paper free, we can reduce cost of material of processing. Otherwise, we can support the electronic custom clearing activity because in Vietnam, under the control of the government, uh, we are just joining also the single window uh, custom clearance for the post mail as well. If you want to join this uh, project of the government, we also have uh, all the electronic processing with the air carrier, with the custom and also the post. So it is a very benefit for Vietnam Post here. And the last one, as my beginning, it is so nice that a good approaching by Vietnam Post to reform and, and also to digitalization uh, transformation in our supply chain to the customer. But by the benefit that we can get from our project, there's been some of the difficulty and also the challenge that we need to get the overview and also try to get the solutions for this. The first one, we find out that not 100% digital processing by GHA and LI. This is a, like a bottleneck when we just uh, start up uh, with the first uh, kata uh, when we was in the trial time with the post not. Uh, Sometimes the card is rested available and airline with the post available too, but airline with the GHA not available. So when we get uh, the cooperation with GHA, we face with a lot of challenges in this. The second problem during the extreme of EDI, some of the technical issue can be arise, missing card rested message, etc. And the last one, uh, after the operations of paperless, perhaps uh, we have uh, to think over about the payment by IPS and PASS as a platform uh, for the payment with the electronic proof of CN38. Next slide, please. And it is uh, our lessons for this. Perhaps uh, I hope can help all the other deal who are interested in the paperless uh, projects can learn something here. The first lesson, uh, it is uh, how to establish the process before we can start up. Uh, each deal need to analyze, evaluate and establish internal processing for both inbound and outbound between the deal, ally, ground handling and custom also very important if you want to avoid the bottleneck between GHA and ally. The second one strengthens cooperation. It is so necessary to have a close cooperative relationships between the deal, local custom ally and ground handling in all situations. Because without this the support of all the circle between the custom ally and also ground handling, we cannot do anything here. And the next one, it is a connective ability. Of course, uh, it is uh, like uh, the mandatory condition if you want to join the paperless because uh, we use only the EDI message to replace all the manual document of CN38. And the last one, it is also we need the support from the EPU. Uh, we would like to be, we would like to ask EPU as uh, the contact point, a project between the origin DO the destination deal and ally. And until now, I always believe that Jan and Madame Mette very perfect in the, these positions to support Vietnam. 
to solve and the guide all the mandatory principle on how e-payment will be implemented with the paperless. After oper operations of paperless, of course, now we need to take, to take consideration how to do for the next step of payment with the electronic proof of CN38. And the last one, uh, to support of the e-payment, we need to research on an upgraded version of IPS integrated with the PASS. So this is uh, some the uh, experiencing and also my understanding uh, at the level of position of the DO who joined the, as a volunteer to the projects of paperless at CN38. Thank you very much for the listening. If any question, you can share it with me. Thank you very much, uh, QA, for a great presentation, and not only for presentation, but also great support of Vietnam Post to promote this idea, to implement this uh, idea in the, in the region. Uh, I really appreciate. Uh, due to the time uh, concern, uh, I uh, will uh, give a floor for some comments or questions after a whole block of, of three presentation focus on uh, paper free. Uh, but this presentation was an ex excellent example that. Uh, uh, um, that um, implementation of uh, uh, electronic advanced data exchange or, or EDI messages mentioned in the presentation uh, should not be seen only as an additional cost uh, of uh, pause or carriers to meet some legal requirements, but it should be seen also as an opportunity to simplify the processes. You saw in the presentation that paper-free transport means not only uh, to transport mail without papers, uh, but uh, it could mean also a, a, a step towards a paper free uh, custom clearance, for example, or paper free accounting, as was mentioned by, by uh, uh, QA in the last slide. So uh, now I'd like to give a floor also to, to carriers to say a little bit about uh, paper free transport. And we are very happy that uh, uh, Pascal Lai from, uh, from uh, uh, Cathay Pacific is ready now to share his uh, experience and his ideas regarding the uh, uh, paper-free transport. So, Pascal, floor is yours. Pascal? I cannot hear Pascal, so... Uh... Can you hear, can you hear me, Pascal? Can you uh... speak? Jan? Is it yes, fine now? We can hear you. We can hear you now. Yes, okay. go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Jan and UPU uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, Cafe Digital Experience and uh, by going paperless. Uh, my name is Pascal, and I'm, I'm the uh, Cargo Customer Solutions Manager at Cafe Pacific Airways. Uh, where I oversee the time-sensitive solutions and the developments in our cargo division. Okay, so let me uh, proceed uh, to uh, to discuss uh, about my slides. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, we believe that uh, going from paper to paperless has a substantial impact uh, on our mail solutions and processes. Uh, not only it can optimize our internal process, but it also improves our ability to provide a better service uh, to our customer. Uh, previously, uh, with all the paper handlings, uh, we were not able to control our performance. Uh, the way we handle mail was very manual and disjointed. And of course, uh, this led to lack of ability to uh, satisfy post uh, requirements, uh, including uh, low shipment visibility 
and uh, low commitment to shipment delivery. Uh, from airlines perspective, uh, one of the key elements uh, to improve the internal process and, per, uh, and, and performance uh, is to ensure that uh, the mail shipment uh, can be uh, uh, flown as booked, uh, meaning that we have to create a booking for the mail shipment, uh, uplift and handle it as per the booking. Uh, however, uh, with the paper handling, uh, we were not able to create booking uh, for the shipment uh, accurately. Uh, not only because of the unreliable forecast, uh, in most of the cases uh, with the CN38 document, uh, we also found quite a lot of gaps uh, between what have been uh, listed in the CN38 and what we physically accepted uh, from the post, uh, resulting in incomplete information for our control. Uh, therefore, the mail could not be uh, delivered as expected as well. Uh, in addition, in handling uh, the account billing and payment disputes, uh, we could only rely on CN38, uh, in which uh, most of the cases, uh, the records might not uh, necessarily tally with the actual uplift uh, from the flight, uh, which causes a lot of issues uh, uh, throughout the end-to-end -to -end process. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, since 2018, uh, CAFE has been working with uh, postal partners to address the post office operation pain points. Uh, basically, we integrated our mail handling system uh, with our cargo operation system, uh, providing uh, different tools and facilities to, uh, to, to support our partners, uh, including uh, to redesign the, the whole end-to-end -end journey uh, with a digitized mail handling process, uh, which we can see that there's a big improvement uh, so far uh, uh, up to now. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of our, of our solution, uh, in March 2020, uh, CAFE upgraded uh, its mail services uh, provided to POST. Uh, the solution is mainly to expand and optimize the use of EDI to enable end-to-end uh, -end solution through the uh, postal AOB concept, uh, one that is similar to, uh, to how we handle the cargo. Uh, it allows us to use uh, one system to handle all shipment types, uh, including mail, uh, which it greatly increases our control and visibility of shipment uh, transportation. Uh, with the uh, postal AOB solution, uh, we can create mail booking automatically uh, for the card we receive from the post. Um, we can capture the, the flown data automatically and the data will be, of course, will be used and carried forward uh, for our billing process. Uh, in addition, it also allows us to, to leverage existing cargo technology. Uh, for example, uh, the, cap uh, the capability to send the preloading advanced data to customs, uh, the capability to locate each specific mail back uh, in the warehouse, uh, which it, uh, greatly improve our visibility on the shipment uh, movement. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, okay, uh, next one, uh, not. Uh, I think it's the, the preview, okay. Uh, no, 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 sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, correct, yes. So uh, with our digitized end-to-end -end process and the data transparency, uh, it gives us an opportunity to upgrade our scanner app as well. Uh, we streamline our scanning process to make the process and more efficient and uh, effective. Uh, for example, we have automated the nesting process. Uh, previously, it was a separate flow that we need to generate the nesting barcode in the system. Uh, we have to print it out and attach it to the ULD. Uh, but in most scenarios, by the time when the ULD was arrived at the, at the transit port or the, at the destination, uh, the paper was missing. So the only option for us was to scan every mail back. Uh, unfortunately, this was uh, one of the root causes that we found out of low visibility at the destination. So uh, with the new function in place, we can simply scan each mail back and the ULD at the origin. Uh, it automatically links each mail back with the ULD and creates the nesting uh, without the usage of nesting barcode. Uh, it streamlines our process with the paperless nesting solution. And of course, it greatly improves our visibility as well at the transit hub, as well as at the destination. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, data transparency is essential for uh, building trust with our customers. Uh, therefore, with the track and trace platform, uh, it allows us uh, to, uh, to, uh, and also as well as the customers to retrieve the shipment transport information uh, through our system. Uh, it greatly improves the visibility of the shipment. 
according to the result of our KPI performance, uh, around 30% of the shipments we handle today uh, are without cardit or without a proper cardit for the mail shipment. So uh, in a way, it's very important for our customers to have the, this platform uh, to retrieve the required information they need, uh, including, uh, for example, the booking information, uh, as well as the uh, status of the shipment in uh, receptacle level. Uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to cargo capacity, uh, weight and volume are the units uh, to measure how much capacity the cargo will take up on a flight. Uh, however, for mail, uh, it's only measured by weight. Uh, during the booking stage or even at the time uh, uh, of, of shipment acceptance, uh, it's hardly for us to measure the volume of the mail bag. Uh, therefore, uh, it's important for us to determine the volume of the mail bag uh, with the his historical data. Uh, it gives us the ability to determine the volume uh, with the defined density factor. Uh, for every customer, for, for, uh, uh, for a different kind of product or even uh, on OD level, uh, it's, it's quite specific to, to, for us to, to find the, the specific density factor for, uh, for the shipment. And uh, it gives us the ability to determine the volume uh, with the defined uh, density factor. Uh, to us, of course, uh, it helps us to maximize the use of load capacity in a more efficient way. Uh, but to our customers, uh, it also uh, 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 improves our delivery commitment, uh, commitment because uh, uh, it decreases the frequency of shipment over tender as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with the system integration uh, between our mail and cargo systems uh, through the postal AOB concept, uh, it also allow us to uh, co connect the shipment data information uh, retrieved from the cardit uh, with our cargo system handling. Uh, therefore, to fulfill all these kind of uh, regulatory uh, requirements, uh, including the uh, ICS2 requirements that will be implemented in March 2023. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have enhanced our scanner app to ensure that we have the control and uh, visibility of the shipment status by checking the AR flag in the, in the cardit. Uh, for every mail bag that uh, we accept from the post. So I think uh, especially uh, as, a, as, a, as a start, it's very important for us to control that and make sure that uh, we can uh, fulfill uh, the requirement before we uplift the, the shipment uh, on the flight. Uh, next slide, please. Coming next, uh, we have the mail KPI dashboard that will be implemented in Q2 2023. Uh, with the data insights and the uh, analytics, uh, it helps us uh, to have a deep understanding of our performance in different stations. Uh, it also helps us to uncover which part we need to uh, we need more work to increase performance, and whether the performance is met according to our, our customer needs. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, it's the Postal Accounts Reconciliation Platform. Uh, I think th this is uh, also one of the pain points from uh, post office and as well as the airlines. Uh, uh, we have a plan to uh, implement uh, this function in Q4 next year. Uh, one of the key objective uh, is of course to allow us to provide the receptacle level da data to post, uh, therefore to uh, facilitate the account reconciliation process. Uh, another objective is to streamline and speed up our billing process that allow um, for higher transparency, uh, which it, it improves the accuracy of mail invoicing and our uh, reconciliation ability. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with the data transparency, uh, it gives us another opportunity to collaborate, uh, collaborate with our partners to improve the performance together. Uh, which it facilitates uh, mail handling benefits uh, such as uh, uh, innovation or solving the problem in a more efficient way. Uh, for example, uh, we are able to share the card quality with our partners so we can work uh, with them to address the issues together and it improves the overall performance uh, very fast. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, moving to my last slide uh, with the introduced uh, digital uh, digitized solutions and, and, and uh, the tools uh, in the previous slides. Uh, basically, we are ready to uh, implement uh, paper-free transport. Uh, moving forward, uh, we would like to extend it to our partners as well. So uh, starting from next year, uh, we have a plan to work with different partners uh, to implement the change. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, this would take some time to process uh, as it, will, it, it involves uh, adjustment in the contractual agreement uh, with the post. Uh, so uh, we are also looking for uh, if there's any so, uh, a simplified way to implement it uh, that would even uh, be better. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to replace the bilateral, uh, the bilateral or trilateral agreement uh, by a global agreement. Yeah, uh, I think that's all for my update. Uh, if you have any comment or question, uh, I'm happy to uh, to answer it. And uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pascal, for your excellent presentation. I see one question in the chat. Uh, maybe you can answer in the chat, or we will give a floor to some additional questions also after uh, the, the third presentation focus on uh, paper free after Meta's presentation. But I really appreciate your, your support. Uh, we are very happy with uh, cooperation with uh, Qatar, uh, Qatar Pacific, but also uh, Qatar Airways or uh, uh, Lufthansa, as was mentioned in earlier presentation. Uh, uh, and we hope that we will continue in such cooperation as will be presented by Meta in the next presentation. So, uh, Pascal, please answer the question in the in the chat, if if you may. And if not, we will give you a floor later. Yeah. Now, I'd like to give a floor to Meta. Meta, floor is yours. Thank you, Yen. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Meta Bison and I work for PostNor. Apart from working for PostNor, I am also the co-chair of the UPU Transport Group and the YET UPU Contact Committee. And maybe I should also start apologizing if I'm not that clear. I've got a very terrible cold, at least I think it's terrible, and um, it's not always easy. Yes, may I have the next slide, please? The question is how to get started here, and it all depends on the experience you have for those who have no experience, the best way to start could be to contact either IB or IPC and express an interest in becoming a paper-free partner. And together with these two parties, one of them, both of them, define the contact details, get a presentation of the paper-free guidelines and define the routes that are in scope and obtain contact details. And then follow the process for implementing paper-free transports. If you are an experienced partner, it would of course be easy just to jump to bullet point three here. Next slide, please. This process diagram has been developed based on a lot of experience. It's no secret that we in post nor prefer paper-free transports and are already paper-free to a lot of destinations. It is developed based on, on the post, the origin post being the starting point, but it can of course be both the carrier and the destination post. So the first thing is to express an interest in being paper-free and contact the partners. If they're not interested, everything stops immediately. I mean, that's how it is. If all parties are interested, there's a checklist in the guidelines that can be used. And once you've gone through the checklist and everything is okay, then you can have the tripartite agreement, which Pascal just spoke about. And you can talk about if there's a need for a pilot or not. Um, it's my experience that pilots can be good sometimes if you're, you're starting with a new carrier, but if you're already doing it with a carrier that you already have several destinations pay free, then there's no need. But you can go through it. And once you've done the pilot, is it successful? Yes or no, or do you want to continue? Or, is there, or are there some corrective actions that need to be implemented? And this way you can actually go through it and fairly easy become paper-free. Next slide, please. This slide shows the paper-free partners as of 1st November, 2022. And I know I speak for operations both in Denmark and Sweden the more the merrier. We, our operations are very keen to get rid of the paper. They think it helps them a lot in their daily uh, work life that they don't have to handle all these papers. The list will be kept updated and an updated section will be available in the UPU website. Next slide, please, Rina. If you want more information about pay-free transport, you are welcome to contact the transport group at the UPU or engage at IPC. 
And if you want to find the pay-free route implementation guidelines, they are available on the UPU website and in five different languages. So that was my short presentation here. Thank you very much, Mete, for your uh, uh, short but very clear presentation. There is really a link uh, to contact the IPC or UPU for those of you who are interested to join this uh, very uh, promising activity uh, <clears throat> to, to decrease our costs and simpl simplify our processes. And uh, uh, as you understood, I hope from a previous presentation, uh, there are some preconditions to join this project. It means that first of all, post and carrier must be uh, EDI capable. It means that they must to exchange card addressed messages, but not only exchange, but they, the messages must be in a good quality. So uh, from that point of view, I would strongly recommend also to join UPU compliance project. It's, uh, it, there is a report uh, on monthly basis, free of charge for all carriers or posts participating in the project to see the quality of the messages which are of course very important. You need also to involve customs. Uh, so uh, it's not easy sometimes, but uh, uh, as we succeed in many countries, I'm sure that we, we can continue and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, use this project in more and more countries. Uh, I also appreciate uh, comments, for example, from uh, Pascal, uh, uh, that um, there are some ideas how to maybe simplify our current guidelines, uh, simplify the processes, uh, and we will discuss them, we will consider them, and uh, uh, hope we will, uh, uh, we will uh, make it even easier for all of you uh, to join this uh, activity. Uh, I don't know whether we have uh, some uh, uh, comments or questions. Maybe if I may, uh, Pascal, I'd like to ask you to answer the question uh, which uh, I saw uh, in the chat. How does your density dashboard really works? And where do you get data about the density from? So could I ask you to answer this question, please? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Continue. Go ahead. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah uh, basically, basically uh, it's, it's all from our historical data. data. Uh, Depends, depends on, on the, the weight, weight of the shipment and uh, also depends on the unit size to, to define, define the density factor. So, uh, so based on the historical data, we can uh, uh, make, make use of the density factor and define the volume of the shipment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then I see uh, also the question, maybe out of the scope, as it is written in the chat, does UPU have uh, info on system providers that can offer carded postal available solution mainly for ICS requirements? Yes, uh, we have a contact with uh, a few uh, IT suppliers or uh, system providers. And uh, I'm happy to say that also uh, uh, many of them are already able to meet all ICS requirements. We are uh, testing with some of them uh, or piloting uh, solutions. And uh, if you would like to get more information, please contact me by email after the webinar and I will be more than happy to give you contacts to such uh, system providers. Thank you. So I do not see more questions or raise hands and, uh, and so, I'd like to uh, uh, close this, uh, this uh, block of three presentations focused on paper free. Thanks to all, uh, all uh, 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 speakers. And uh, I'd like to encourage all who are interested uh, in this uh, activity, contact uh, me or contact the IPC. Uh, the links are uh, on the slides, which will be available on the UPU and IATA uh, uh, websites immediately after the workshop, after the webinar. So now I'd like to give the floor to my colleague uh, Vincent Desiderio from the International Bureau of UPU, uh, who will present uh, uh, who will present um, uh, something more about uh, about the dangerous uh, goods in the post. 
uh, about uh, recognition of this uh, dangerous good and reporting these incidents or this dangerous good in the mail. So, Vini, floor is okay. Yes, I can hear you and see you very well. Perfect. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. My name is Vinny Desiderio, and I'm, the, I'm serving as the Postal Operations and Safety Expert for the Universal Postal Union at the IB here in Bern, Switzerland. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the IATA UPU Contact Committee for this opportunity to present this message on dangerous goods today. Um, as you're probably aware, the movement of dangerous goods, both declared and undeclared, represents a significant challenge to mail transport, especially in this new e-commerce driven world. Uh, hopefully some of the information presented here will be useful with respect to helping you navigate the significant challenge uh, to, to safety and security in our environments. So just real quick, uh, the goals and objectives here are to provide a high level overview of dangerous goods, sometimes referred to as DG, uh, provide an overview of UPU dangerous goods regulations and where they fit within the context of the international regulatory framework, discuss the importance of dangerous goods recognition and the ways such materials may be found during acceptance and transportation, discuss the importance of reporting non-compliant dangerous goods shipments, and highlight some recent efforts that the UPU has either been involved with as a collaborator or developed in-house with the goal of making the post safer with respect to the transportation of dangerous goods. So just real quick, what are dangerous goods? For those of you that don't know, these are articles or substances which are capable of posing a significant risk to health, safety, property, or the environment during transportation. Uh, these are materials that are put into nine classifications with some of those classes having subdivisions in them. And if I can just point to one of those real quick, compressed gases right here, uh, class two is split into three divisions. You have division 2.1 flammable gases, division 2.2 non-flammable non-toxic gases, and division 2.3 uh, toxic gases. And some of these other uh, classes have subdivisions as well, but it'll take too long to go through that. And um, that's a whole nother training that everybody should be taking anyway. I will highlight class nine over here because this is kind of the catch all for things that are relatively dangerous that don't fall into any of the other eight classes and includes most notably lithium batteries that we'll touch on a little bit more in a bit. So uh, with respect to the regulatory framework, the UN model regulations serve as the foundation for basically building the other regulations that fall into line with that. And you can think of this as a pyramid, the UN model regulations, and then as you go up that pyramid, things get more specific. So with respect to air transportation, the foundational regulations are found in the ICAO technical instructions, which are on the left of your screen. And IATA, with their dangerous good regulations, takes that a little bit further because they, they kind of streamline uh, the requirements into a more manageable book that's easier to comprehend for everybody. But they also add in um, carrier specific restrictions that have all been agreed upon, or even certain carriers that have specific requirements with respect to the acceptance of dangerous goods on their own. And then on top of that, as we approach the top of the pyramid and things get a little bit more specific, we have the UPU convention manual, specifically article 19 of that manual, which outlines the dangerous good regulations for the international post. Uh, how can you get there? If you wanna find article 19, and you, you can go to the uh, UPU website, you go to where it says about UPU, you'll get a drop down, and then that'll take you to this header right here, which says acts of union and other decisions. And then you could just go down to manuals and three volumes. You click on that, you get a pop-up window and you can see the convention manual here. And then you can just go to the English update or the most recent version that's there, click on that and that will get you in. So <clears throat> by convention within article 19, there are very few classes of dangerous goods that are allowed in the international post. And this is also codified in the ICAO technical instructions and the IATA dangerous goods regulations as well. But it's easier, therefore, to discuss what is allowed as, the, as opposed to what is not, because pretty much everything is not allowed in the International Post. So within Article 19, Articles 19-001 and 19-003 of the UPU Convention outline the three types of materials that are admitted exceptionally, and these include accepted quantity radioactive materials, um, which is kind of surprising. You wouldn't think radioactive materials would be permitted, but these are radioactive materials with extremely low activity. Um, the International Atomic Energy Association is, is on top of that agency, excuse me. Um, that's where those regulations come in. But the significant re 
restrictions involved here typically include the regulatory authorities of the countries of acceptance and delivery being involved in the decision to be able to ship those materials. Um, and, and also, uh, along with accepted quantity radioactive materials is infectious substances, uh, but there's also significant restrictions there. And infectious substances, we're talking about UN 3373, uh, category B infectious materials, things that are not that infectious that can be transported, as well as exempt human specimens, for example, DNA kits that can be transported internationally. Uh, but more economically important, and I think of concern to everybody, is equipment containing lithium batteries. So these are allowed in the post, but it must be noted that in order for somebody to accept these into their posts and transport them on an international basis in air transportation, that post will need to have the um, approval of their civil aviation authorities. And there's, there's a process that we've built out here to help guide both, both the post and the CAA in that, in that country uh, navigate that process, which is which could be pretty arduous. Uh, one other thing that I'll note, um, we're concentrating on air transportation, but there is an allowance for other classes of dangerous goods to be transported in the international post between member countries. Uh, however, those two countries and any countries that those materials are tr transiting through would need to agree that those are permitted through, through their, their space. Uh, the items need to be in compliance with all national and international requirements. And the materials cannot be carried in air transportation. So that agreement basically limits transportation to road, rail, and marine transport only. So uh, this is important and, and more or less the reason why we're here. Recognition of dangerous goods, uh, marks and labels primarily, is critical with respect to the recognition of declared DG. So dangerous goods need to be prepared very specifically in accordance with the rules and regulations. And that includes internal packaging, external packaging, marking and labeling requirements, and very often documentation as well. Uh, compliant dangerous goods shipment, when they're prepared properly, and meaning that they're compliant, will have various obvious marks that are really good indicators that DG is in the package. Uh, the problem there being that sometimes consumers will reuse boxes and they don't understand what the dangerous goods marks and labels are on those packages so that makes things confusing but we still need to be vigilant um, one point that i'll throw out there is that if, even if somebody's shipping cookies for the holidays and it's in a box that contains any of these prohibited marks uh, that mark that box cannot move through the system it should not be accepted it should not get to the air carriers and it should not be delivered on the other end, regardless of what the description of the material is. So on this slide, there are two exceptions regarding some of the marks that are allowed in the post. And basically these are the only two DG marks that can be sent via international post. I did mention equipment containing lithium batteries before. Equipment containing lithium batteries are permitted with the CAA approval for acceptance. However, the boxes should not, or the packages should not bear any lithium battery marks. And there's a reason for this. And that reason being that anything that bears that mark is over the limit at which the post would be able to accept those for um, transportation through the post. And that limit is typically for cells, for individual cells or two batteries um, with a 100 watt hour limit on the batteries. We can get into it. Uh, you can probably do an entire uh, <laughs> webinar on lithium batteries alone and the requirements for, for to be able to ship them. Now, I was talking about declare dangerous goods. Those are compliant shipments where people are actually trying to do the right thing. However, there's a bigger problem out there now with the emergence of e-commerce. We have a lot of unknowledgeable people entering the shipping and transportation industry that are selling materials that they don't even realize are dangerous goods. Uh, so undeclared dangerous goods are, are always prohibited and, and often very dangerous because you don't know what's in that box. You don't know what's in the package. So some commonly encountered materials uh, include various household items that most people aren't aware of their status as dangerous goods, such as flammable liquids in the form of perfumes or hand sanitizers, compressed gases, most notably flammable aerosols as spray disinfectants, hairspray, spray paint, et cetera. Um, safety and strike anywhere matches, the strike anywhere matches being a really significant concern because just under pressure, these things can ignite uh, and it, Ignition involving strike anywhere matches and an aircraft is just an unacceptable thing to occur. And then of course, lithium batteries. So if you look on the screen, we have this little power pack right here. That's what's known as a UN 3480 lithium battery, which would not be allowed in international air transportation via the post. Uh, this is a very common item, um, but once again, it would be prohibited. 
Unfortunately, though, some people are fully aware of what they're doing, and they are typically shipping in a non-compliant manner to avoid packaging costs and DG fees or dangerous good fees that would be required through cargo networks. And this presents an elevated risk, primarily because these are higher volume shippers, and they know the risk of what they're doing and putting those materials into the system regardless. The recognition of undeclared DG. This is a, a really significant challenge because if the box is sealed, you don't know what's in there, but there are ways of preventing that, uh, but there's also ways of viewing that. So one of the best ways of preventing undeclared dangerous goods from entering the postal network is educating your acceptance personnel and interacting with your customers to educate them as well, and provide awareness and determine if they're shipping DG. Uh, any acceptance office really should have very noticeable posters in there, maybe some guidance or the knowledgeable staff can help walk people through so that people realize what they're shipping is a dangerous good and they shouldn't be putting in that box and it should not be getting on an airplane. Uh, open box submission is really a best practice along these lines. So if acceptance personnel can see what's in the box when the person presents it to them, they can educate the shipper right on the spot and prevent these materials from entering the system. Unfortunately, this option is not always feasible all around the world due to various local restrictions, but if it's something that can be enacted, it is definitely a best practice. As a second line of prevention, x-ray screening can be used, where allowed, again, to detect and remove DG from postal networks prior to transportation. So if you look on the screen, you see some obvious stuff in there that pops out at you. Obviously, there's the handgun. Uh, and this may or may not be restricted depending upon how it's being sent and where it's going. But, what I want to point out right below that is the, the aerosol can, which would always be uh, prohibited in international post. Whether it's flammable or not, it's, it's compressed gas and it's always prohibited in the international post via air transportation. Uh, along with those two techniques that I just mentioned, there's another line of defense being created here um, at the UPU through the Postal Technology Center or PTC, and that's the dangerous goods search tool. And this is, um, a data-driven tool that is basically going to produce probabilities that something contained, that a package contains something uh, dangerous. So there's going to be a lot of inputs into the system that are important, and then there'll be some, some outputs that go to the post, and they'll be able to make decisions based on the information they're receiving as to whether or not something contains a dangerous good. So in line with this, I want to jump into reporting of dangerous goods because the reported information can be fed into this dangerous goods search tool to help refine the algorithms that are being used to determine whether something might be dangerous in the package. So the post is a significant nexus that interacts with shipper, recipients, and various modes of transportation. The overlap with aviation with this consideration is especially significant uh, and especially significant to the international post as most routes require air transportation to move mail in a fast and efficient manner. So it's therefore imperative that open lines of communication exist between all parties involved. With that being said, if anything is found in any network at any point involving the mail to contain a dangerous good, it should be reported to the UPU. We do have a mechanism for doing that. On the screen, you see our dangerous goods at upu.int mailbox. Uh, on the Postal Security Group site portion of the UPU website, there is a form that can be filled out and submitted to that mailbox. And once again, that information once received, it can be communicated to the post of acceptance for their awareness, but it also can be stored and used to help refine that algorithm and the dangerous good search tool that's being developed. And last but not least, I just want to go through a couple of resources that are out there, and then I can finish. Um, strong collaborative efforts with IATA are constantly ongoing and continue to produce important documents and opportunities for outreach and joint learning. This webinar being one of those um, outputs that come out of these collaborations. But I also want to highlight the IATA UPU Mail Safety Guidelines, uh, which is an excellent document and provides some great guidance. Also, a couple other things that exist out there that should be hitting the website soon or already exist on the website are our updated dangerous goods training, which can be open source to any post that's willing to accept it. Um, it it's been updated to include new regulations regarding lithium batteries, highlight some of the, the challenges that exist out there that are being spoken about right now. And then on the right side of the screen, we have our resource page once again under the Postal Security Group. Uh, site on the UPU website. Uh, there's a lot of really great resources that are on there that can be used uh, as open source materials. And that being said, I thank you for your time and I, I really appreciate your willingness to listen. Have a great day, everybody.
Thank you very much, Winnie, for your uh, presentation. I appreciate it. You really was able also uh, to manage the presentation within the time slot dedicated for you. Uh, uh, we are 10 minutes in the schedule, but everything is OK. Uh, and uh, this presentation was, uh, uh, was uh, included to, the, uh, to this uh, webinar because, uh, as you know, uh, during these weeks and months, we are talking mostly about uh, ICS2, Electronic Advanced Data, EDI Exchange, but we just wanted to confirm that safety and security uh, always was, is, and must be also in the future, uh, uh, one of the priorities. Uh, and we, we are really taking care about that jointly with the IATA, as uh, Vinny mentioned, for example, male safety guidelines, but many other capacity building activities we are jointly uh, um, doing together with the IATA uh, to, uh, to arrange that uh, all mail handed over to carriers is uh, safe and meeting all uh, security uh, requirements. So thank you very much. I do not see at this moment any, any ah, I see some, uh, there are uh, some uh, requests for a, for a floor, so I I gave a uh, gave a floor to Samir. Could you? Yes. Could you? Okay, floor is yours. You can raise your uh, question. Okay, uh, it's not a question, but uh, I want to to put. Uh, uh, Mail. Uh, normally, uh, the, the dangerous goods recognized by uh, marking or labeling are, uh, are uh, easy to detect. But the problem of dangerous goods, which, knows, which is not detectable, there is no marking, no labeling, that's the problem. So uh, we try uh, in UPU, uh, especially in training program, to improve uh, this, uh, this uh, kind of training to detect and uh, I'm labelable and uh, unremarkable uh, dangerous goods. And that's all. Thanks, you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samir, for your comments. Uh, I don't know whether uh, Winnie would like to add something more, but thanks for that comment. Winnie? I mean, in, in the interest of time, I think it's a very important thing to point out, but I, I wouldn't dwell on it too much because um, it's, a, it's a full conversation. But obviously, yeah, undeclared DG represents a significant issue. And that's kind of where the reporting comes in too, because something's eventually going to break open somewhere along the line. And if that breaks open and it gets reported, at least we have awareness of that shipper. And we've seen that over the last, or even if customs find something. So, if, and, and that's a whole other conversation. If customs find something, it should be reported to the post. The post can report it to the UPU, then we can get it back to origin. Uh, we recently had shipments coming out of one country involving um, sodium metal uh, that was being shipped undeclared. And that, that's really bad because if that stuff breaks open in flight, just atmospheric moisture can cause it to eventually ignite. And it's something we definitely want to be made aware of. Thank you, Winnie. I'd like to give a floor now to Lareco. Floor is yours. Can you raise your question? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, normally, uh, I, I ask the question, but the, the again, okay. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, dangerous goods, which is labeling and remarkable. We can recognize it in uh, in postal mail, but the problem is with uh, uh, and unremarkable goods like alcohol, like, uh, like uh, perfume. There is no thing we uh, show to, to, to the agent that there is dangerous goods in this, in this uh, parcel. Uh, I'm sorry, but we, can, we lost you. Your internet connection probably is not the best. But I think that uh, you raised the same question as a few minutes ago and, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Winnie already answered. So if I may, I, I'd like to move and uh, ask Lereko Koloi, 
to uh, to provide his question because uh, you are asking for a floor. Can you? Can we cannot hear you? Can you raise your question, please? Yes, hello. 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 Yes. Can you I think can you with my question. Yes, Normally a... I I I'm speaking about the training group awareness for the people who who I'm sorry, Samir, but we, we cannot hear you and uh, we need to move. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, I see that QA is also asking for a floor. QA, can you, you can, ha you have a floor, you can ask your question. I don't know what's the problem, but uh, I cannot uh, hear anybody who is asking for a floor. Maybe one more try with Lereco. Okay, I see that. Uh, there is no no chance to 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 hear you. So uh, uh, I see in the QA part of the uh, Zoom platform that uh, there is a thanks for a good presentation uh, to focus on the awareness of dangerous good from Nico Smith. Uh, uh, and uh, there is also a question whether we provide online uh, live dangerous good training or awareness training for designated operators. So uh, we have uh, maybe Vini, you could answer whether we are providing and how we are providing dangerous good training on or awareness training for designated operators, please. Um, and Jan, I don't know if you want to expand upon it, but we just um, we're working on an agreement with IATA right now to get some IATA training to designated operators. Uh, I don't know if if you want to expand upon that, but the other training that it's just, just general, it's a, it's a PowerPoint that has notes in there. And it's basically kind of a train the trainer situation will be posted on the website and available for anybody that wants to use it. And I think if anybody wants anything more than that, they can just reach out using the, the dangerous goods at upu.int um, and, and something can be arranged. <laughs> Thank you, Winnie. Yes, you are right. Uh, we can mention that uh, we are in a close cooperation with the IATA preparing a dangerous good certification for the for people uh, around the world. It will be by, it will be prepared uh, region by region. We should start with the Caribbean, and uh, we will contact uh, uh, designated operators to nominate the the, the people uh, to participate in that training and the people should get also certificate if they need, uh, of course, uh, a requirement. And the last try to give a floor to QA. QA, can you hear me and uh, you can uh, ask the question? Yeah, if... yeah. So, sorry, Jack. Yeah, something wrong with my with my microphone. So now I, I would like to ask something about the DG because the DG is a really hot topic for all the deal. Uh, uh, the same as the other deal, we would like to have uh, the support uh, because uh, now every year, Vietnam Post, we send our staff at all the level from the management and also the operation side to join all the DG uh, workshop and also the DG training course. And then we have uh, to pass um, the licensing issuing uh, exams to get the certificate of DGs to all the staff uh, at the uh, CAT4 at least and CAT6 for the management staff. So if the UPU and IATA do open and host some of the training costs to all the DO, 
The first uh, benefit, we can raise up the knowledge of the DG. The second one, we can have uh, the training annually to get more the knowledge, and then we can pass easily to get the certificate as DG to all the DO. So it is uh, my questions to Vincent and you also. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, QA, for your uh, comments noted. And uh, as we said, we are preparing uh, uh, regional uh, workshops and uh, we will consider also your comment how to manage uh, uh, with usage of uh, some funds, for example, coming from, from the US or other countries to uh, support uh, capacity building activities in this important issue. Thanks a lot uh, for all, uh, all okay, your... One more question. Uh, can I ask Vincent? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, each DO need also the um, uh, publication of the DG list published by the IATA. So it is often published on the website of IATA. So if possible, so can share so with the, all the DO by the file or shop, shop files is okay because now if you want to get it because it's very important to update all the list of dangerous good and also the others and uh, uh, I, I believe that all the deal have to buy every year I myself also have to buy uh, to update all the my knowledge and also I can upgrade to all the staff of my level so it is a very good and good opportunity if, if you can work with IATA uh, to have the soft file of the directory of dangerous good annually, and then can deliver to all the DO by the workshop or even that by the POC session. Thank you. Thank you. Winnie, could you answer, please? Um, yeah, and this has been an internal conversation because there's the CDS uh, database that contains a lot of that information that, that should be accessible to any designated operator. Um, and there has been, it basically references the, the dangerous goods regulations and their list of dangerous goods. Um, you know, it's, it's a constantly evolving field. So it's really kind of outside the scope of the UPU. I don't know if, if Andre or, or Matthew wanted to answer from, from IATA's perspective on that. I understand, you know, the books are relatively expensive and you need them, uh, but it's really worth having and, and worth the price of getting it. So you, you understand what's going on. It, it Honestly, it's not gonna change very much from year to year from the post perspective, because we're looking at what's exceptionally admitted, not everything else when it's classified, it's basically prohibited. So with the exception of accepted quantity, radioactive materials, uh, UN 3373, infectious substances, exempt human specimens and equipment containing lithium batteries that are either two batteries or, or four cells or less, everything else would be prohibited. Thank you very much, Vinny. Uh, I need to close the, 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 this uh, discussion uh, because uh, we have one more topic and I'd like to give a floor to, uh, um, uh, to Mette Boyson. But uh, uh, I see there, there are some questions in the, uh, in, in, in the chat. So uh, I can promise that all, uh, all uh, uh, questions will be answered uh, by me or by speakers uh, uh, um, uh, very soon. And uh, the, uh, there, there are also questions uh, regarding the slides and, and, and presentations. As I, I can repeat again and again, that all uh, presentations will be available on the UPU and IATA uh, website. And uh, uh, you can contact me if you have any problem uh, to, uh, to uh, get these slides. So, but now I'd like to uh, give a floor to uh, Meta Boyson from PostNord and Ayata UPU contact committee co-chair and transport group co-chair. She is doing a great job and uh, uh, she would like to present a few slides regarding the electronic advanced data status. So Meta, floor is yours. Thank you, Yen. And Irina, would you find my slides, please? Irina, we cannot see the slides. Could you share the slides, please? I 
I don't know, Mete, what's going on, but do you have your uh, your presentation? Could you share your screen, please? Um, then I have to find it first. I haven't got it near me. I don't know. Maybe maybe Irina will come soon with your slides. Looks like it's there. Thanks, Irina. Great. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor to, to give this last topic uh, a few words, an uh, EAD status. You see on the left side, the global postal model. I think you all know it, but just to shortly say, it describes, of course, the message flow between the various stakeholders and it shows the number of different entities and the path an EAD request needs to follow. We are working with one global postal model. I think all of us are happy we don't have to implement several postal models. And it's based on the joint principles from ICAO and WCO. Shortly to mention, there are different countries and regions working on EAD with, for example, the Canada, the EU and the UK. ICS2, which is the one the EU is working on, is probably the best known, where we already had released one in March 2021. We have released two coming up March 2023, and then there'll be a third release in April 2024. Next slide, please, Irina. Shortly, where are we right now? Now the Origin Post sends the UPU standardized message, ITMAT, and the predest to destination post. And the destination post in Europe will transfer the information from those messages to the destination customs. Message standards for transmitting a customs referral, also called item ref in our language, and Origin Post response in reacting to these referrals, the ref response, have been approved in versions ready for pilot testing, but there's only a, no, a limited number of posts who actually are transmitting and receiving referrals in IT tests. Pilot testing of transmitting referrals and acting upon them is ongoing. These are the flows 3, 4, 4 plus and 4 plus plus, if you look at the first picture. And with plans for testing operational procedures performed in support of referrals received. There has been developed an EAD check in order to ensure that no items with open referrals are handed over to a carrier for transport to a place of destination. This is being implemented around the world in various um, posts. Some posts have started sending carded with the AR flag. You may know that the AR flag says that there are no open referrals or outstanding referrals, I should probably say, for a place of destination. And we have adopted the UPU regulations to require transmission of carded with the AR flag when mail is transported to place of destinations with a date of effectiveness, 1st January 2023. So that's just around the corner. Next slide, Irina, please. There are a number of challenges. There's no need to, to hide that. And I think we're all aware of it. We have, first of all, the data capture of electronic customs information on all items with goods in order for the post to be able to send the EPMAT message. We have the data quality of the information being provided in the EPMAT message. We all know it, that there's someone popular once who said garbage in, garbage out. If we don't get the right data, we can't send it. Not all posts have currently implemented capability to exchange item ref and ref response, nor the operational functionality needs to support the response protocols to referrals received. Stakeholders, and that's not just posts, but also carriers, have not enough information on how the referral slash response process actually are in order to jointly implement an effective and pragmatic procedure, both IT-wise and operational. We see that exchange of carded rested between posts and carriers is not done on all links. We have a number of carriers who are transporting mail into Europe and according to a survey carried out by IPC, they're not all ready to find their part of the information to the European authorities. The post and carriers have discussed late referrals from a theoretical point. We need pilots, we need to use it 
in real life and, and then look at it again and see where does it need to be adapted. Then there's an ongoing discussion with the European Commission about transit and transshipment, as this represents a significant challenge to all parties involved. Next slide, Irina. If I look at the principles for the next steps, the overall objective is that we, not as, just as pro, but as carriers, we're in it together. We need to comply with the security regulations and maintain high flexibility for the common benefit. We need to minimize the process change and costs and the technical development costs for all involved stakeholders. I think it was Andre who said in the beginning that we all, we're having some difficult times after some years with COVID. We don't need more costs than necessary. And we need to define and resolve the policy and regulations issues as they impact development of IT tools needed. We must together retain a standardized model as much as possible, but with flexibility that could accommodate for possible rarities in the different regions, regulations on the placing requirements. We need to find solutions that will not hamper the main flow, nor require performing processes that are unnecessarily complex for us. And we also have, must have in mind that pilot testing will provide us with some experience and may in the end also influence the possible solutions. But we might as well also be honest, no matter what we do, it will be complex. Post and carriers, we need to work together as partners in order to find the right way forward and the right solution in the end. Next slide, Irina. Right now, there's an ongoing dialogue with the European Commission regarding transit and transshipment. And I can tell you that there's planned a meeting with the European Commission in the beginning of December to continue this talk. There's a continued focus on carded rest exchange between origin post and the contract carrier, and also test version of carded with AR flag for use in cargo manifesting systems by airlines. We are analyzing the outcome of the pilots on flow three, four, four plus, and four plus plus, the referrals and acting upon them. We need to determine the predictable timeframes on when referrals are issued and when posts receive them. We need to determine metrics on the types of referrals issued and also find a standardized and consensus understanding of the reasons and the gravity for their issuance. And other lessons learned to be able to implement the operational support procedures without significantly disrupting the flow of mail. We need to analyze the outcomes of pilots and together draft the joint roadmap on how to deliver agreed steps and solutions in a reasonable timeframe. So in short, we need to work together, finding possible solutions that are acceptable for both parties. And that of course includes evaluating the possible solutions presenting them to the ATU contact committee for discussion of them. And in the end, we need to present them to the relevant bodies at UBU and the ATA for approval. Next slide, I don't think there's more. Nope, that was short status on that. It is ongoing work that takes a lot of effort. Thank you very much, Mete, for your uh, uh, information. Uh, um, and I really appreciate uh, uh, your slides. Uh, I think that uh, thanks to the numerous uh, uh, transport group and IATA UPU contact committee capacity building activities, the number of uh, designated operators uh, or posts and carriers uh, that uh, can exchange card addressed messages uh, has increased uh, uh, dramatically, I would say. Uh, now we have uh, about uh, 160 uh, posts around the world, uh, EDI capable, it means uh, ready to send uh, all messages needed to meet ICS2 requirements or EAD requirements in other regions. Uh, we have 70 carriers uh, already exchanging card addressed messages, but we need to do, as you mentioned earlier, uh, a lot uh, to pilot more and more all uh, flows of the global postal model. It means flows uh, focused on customs or flows focused on transport part of this model. 
uh, to uh, to uh, get more information to finalize uh, the discussion with European Commission and uh, be ready uh, to meet all these re uh, legal requirements uh, soon. Uh, so I'd like to ask all of you who are interested to be involved in the piloting because we have an ongoing piloting with, with many carriers uh, to exchange not only card addressed messages, but card addressed messages with applicable regulation flag, AR flag, which uh, Meta mentioned, uh, to confirm that uh, uh, all items uh, uh, handing, uh, which we would like to hand over to the carrier are meeting all requirements. There are no open referrals. Uh, 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 we would uh, invite all other carriers uh, to join us uh, in this piloting or post uh, to pilot, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, step by step we will uh, be uh, ready to uh, to meet these uh, challenges. I think it was the last presentation. I uh, uh, I see the feedback from uh, from Carlos uh, to Meta. Excellent presentation. Just to let you know, the Brazil is piloting in production with uh, uh, PTA this week about ICS2. Uh, an uh, AR flag in production with Lufthansa. Feel free to contact me about some more details. Yes, uh, uh, Brazil is very active. I, I appreciate support from Brazil Post and uh, their, uh, their piloting with Lufthansa. I am in regular touch with Carlos and uh, uh, the outcome of this uh, uh, pilot uh, we will share with uh, with the uh, EAD steering committee and also with the IATA UP contact committee. Uh, um, and uh, as I said, we will, uh, we will uh, share this information with others to, uh, to um, make all of you uh, ready to meet these requirements. I think there is more uh, questions coming. Uh, maybe there is, thank yeah, you, maybe. thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Jan, but there is a question if I have any idea if there might be a pushback for the March 1st, 2023 date release for, for release two. Sorry, I am not aware of it. Um, I think we're all hoping for it, but I've not heard anything but rumours and I don't think it would be fair to give rumours on. So sorry. Yes, uh, we cannot. Uh, we do not have any official information from European Commission. As Meta already mentioned, the next uh, meeting with European Commission is uh, scheduled on 9th of December. Uh, uh, we will uh, we will continue in our discussion. We already asked European Commission for more flexibility regarding the deadlines uh, on ICS to release two. It looks that there will be some kind of flexibility, uh, but uh, uh, more information I hope we will get after the meeting on 9th of uh, December. And uh, of course, it will depend also on the progress in our piloting to get more uh, arguments uh, 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 to discuss with the European Commission uh, uh, to, uh, to postpone maybe some, some deadlines or give a little bit more time uh, for all stakeholders uh, to be ready uh, to meet these requirements. We are preparing also some, some uh, proposals to amend UP regulations, but of course, this is just uh, for consideration of our members. It takes some time and all of these issues are discussed with the European Commission. But it looks that uh, uh, implementation window uh, uh, will be a little bit postponed and uh, post probably are expected uh, not earlier than in June to, uh, to meet this ICS2 requirement. But as I said, it's still not fixed and we will inform you later. Thank you very much, uh, Mette, once again for your um, uh, information. Uh, uh, we are trying to answer your questions one by one also in the chat. So I hope that uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, answer all of them. But now I'd like to uh, close this topic and move uh, to the uh, closing remarks. Uh, I hope that uh, the topics were interesting. Uh, I hope I, I'd like to thanks uh, to all speakers for excellent, uh, excellent job. And um, uh, let you know that uh, all presentation will be available on the UPU and IATA website. Uh, and uh, if you have any problem, just contact me 
and uh, we will uh, we will help you. Uh, but we would like to uh, improve uh, uh, maybe next time in the webinar, we would like to find uh, relevant topics for you. And that's the reason why we would like to ask you help us uh, and uh, fill uh, the, the questionnaire uh, on the uh, monkey survey a link you can see here. You will uh, receive a link after the webinar by email and you will be asked to provide your uh, feedback, your opinion on, of the webinar uh, and provide some topics which uh, you uh, would like to see maybe in the, in the near future or any other comments or suggestions to help us better meet your needs uh, next time. So uh, I hope that you will help us, you will provide your feedback. It, it takes maybe three minutes, not more. Uh, and uh, uh, together with the IATA, we will analyze your feedback and we will prepare topics uh, for the next webinar according to your needs, according to your needs. Now I'd like to give a floor uh, to Andre to uh, make some uh, closing remarks. Please, Andre, the floor is yours. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I really enjoyed this webinar. I think, again, some uh, excellent information shared with uh, all our participants. Uh, it's, um, it's very important, again, as I said at the very beginning, that we uh, all come together. Uh, have a dialogue and collaborate on, on, on particular issues. Uh, you know that uh, safety is extremely important. Uh, dangerous goods in the mail uh, is something uh, that we have to discover. Some of them are permitted, they are indicated in various regulations, manuals and so on. It's extremely important that we find those that are not accepted for transport because of the risk it poses to the safety of our passengers, uh, uh, crew members and the aircraft itself. So it's extremely important. Uh, the collaboration we've had now with the UPU has been extremely successful. We, there is more to do and we are, we are uh, jointly collaborating on that. So uh, uh, safety is certainly the number one priority. Um, on the digitalization part, we've been there for a while. Uh, I think uh, CN38s uh, are really disappearing from uh, uh, the surface of the globe, but we would like to do a bit more. So EDI exchange is extremely important, not only on the postal side, but definitely on the carrier side as well. We have uh, explained at the last uh, webinar uh, the solution to convert mail uh, messages into cargo messages, and it could also be applied the other way around from cargo messages into mail web, web messages so that we synchronize a little bit uh, uh, the mail system and the cargo system so digitization extremely important um, and then obviously security wise and and uh, what we do with uh, the electronic advanced data filing is of utmost importance so i would invite you to uh, really really connect with uh, your uh, upu uh, uh, counterparts, I mean, the one that will connect with UPU uh, uh, from your postal organization, the same on the airline side with IATA, so that we can try and, and, and make sure that these pilots that we organize are successful because those pilots are extremely important for us to validate most of the assumptions that we make when we uh, develop best practices and standards. So it's extremely important that you have a voice and that you provide that to us. So again, the survey at the end of this webinar is going to help us drive some activities forward and uh, it will also tell us a little bit more what your concerns are and what we should develop then maybe for the next webinar uh, beginning of next year. So thank you again for your participation uh, and uh, really looking forward to see you at our next webinar and to hear what you would like to see. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you to all of you. Thanks. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, uh, your uh, closing remarks were excellent. Nothing more to add. I'd like once again just to thanks for your participation, speakers for excellent job, and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.